Hello and welcome to the Yo Get You Sports Report. I'm your host, Avishai Saul, and I'm on the floor. You might be wondering why I'm on the floor, and I'll tell you. It's to hide the explosive nature of my shirt. Three seasons and 21 episodes in, and I think it's time to celebrate. So I'm wearing my celebration shirt. It may look like the carpet of a bowling alley, but cannot stress enough that when I'm wearing this shirt, I'm having fun. Another reason I'm having fun is because I had a big old cup of coffee before, and so although I have a bit of indigestion, I am talking fast and with energy. It feels good to be alive, everybody. We also have lots of sports to talk about. World Cup going on, Thanksgiving games and football, the quarterway mark of the NBA season, and much, much more. Let's get into it. off with the biggest event in sports right now, the World Cup. There have been some big old games so far, not any of Canada's, unfortunately. I have this theory that because the Canadian women were so successful in these national tournaments before, we got our hopes up higher than they actually should have been for the men competing in this World Cup because we got trounced, like, three times. The U.S. is doing well, though, and some of the biggest games so far, Saudi Arabia upset Argentina, and Japan defied the odds against Germany, overcoming a frankly superior performance by the Germans, but they, they, they overcame it. They won. Just one game, but still, I feel like those soccer players are never going to have to buy another drink for the next 10 years. The World Cup is only going to heat up from here as we get further along and teams start to get eliminated. We start to get closer and closer to the actual finals. And it's just great. I mean, it's, it's pure sports myth-making right here. I will say, though, the one problem I have with the World Cup is that it does bring out all of the inherent racism that exists. I mean, I feel like when we're talking about, like, God damn, those Argentinians and their soccer playing ways, I don't know. I'm not, not specifically f for Argentinians. I'm just saying, for example. But next, moving on to the world of American football. I gotta specify American because football is so popular right now. Every time I Google football, it thinks it's the soccer one. We had some Thanksgiving games for American Thanksgiving and in American football it was an American day as the Vikings beat the Patriots, the Cowboys beat the Giants, and the Bills beat the Lions. As we move on, we're in week 13 now. It might be week 14 by the time you see this. We're gearing up for the Super Bowl. We're starting to see the writing on the wall, the favorites, some superstar teams. We got lots of exciting American football to come. Again, it's only heating up from here. Now moving on to the world of hockey. We had a bit of a streak going. I know it's a little old news, but the New Jersey Devils had a 13 game win streak that was stopped by the Toronto Maple Leafs. I say this because it's important to keep in mind when they're clicking, the Leafs are a Stanley Cup contender. I know as Torontonians, we're conditioned to sort of reject the Leafs' success and it's been disappointing recently, but don't Put your faith in curses. Because what do I always say, kids? Curses aren't always accurate. Yes, the Leafs are a dangerous, dangerous team. Marner and Matthews are as good as any front line in the NHL. They could win. We also had some, we also had some trades going on with the Minnesota Wild trading their fifth round pick to the Rangers for Ryan Reeves and the Toronto Maple Leafs acquiring Connor Timmins, a talented scorer who's had promise but he's been halted by injuries. Now moving on to the world of boxing where ESPN released their top 100 male boxers in the world. Topping off that list was Naya Inoue. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Probably not. Anyway, the 29-year-old is the WBA, WBC, and IBF bantamweight champion with a record of 23-0 and 20 KOs. His next fight is on December 13th versus Paul Butler. It'll be a doozy, and he's definitely on everyone's radar as his star continues to rise. The thing about this top 100 list is that you can't get caught up in the biggest stars of the day. It's different. It's based on pure boxing ability, not superstardom, because of course the heavyweights are gonna be watched more than the bantamweights. It's just the nature of the spectacle. But anyway, is a bad man, and it'll be interesting to see how his popularity grows, especially with this most recent coronation by ESPN. Now moving on to the world of basketball and the NBA, where we have reached the quarterway mark of this season. In honor of this quarterway mark, I want to do my quarterway awards ballots. Maybe not who should win, but maybe two or three guys who are in contention for each of these awards. I'm going to start with Rookie of the Year because it's really a two-man race right now between the Orlando Magic's Paolo Bencaro and the Indiana Pacers' Benedict Matherin. Now, a lot of the basketball minds of the world tempted to decide with Matherin because of a couple of reasons. One, he plays the game with a fire. He's got a real 
intensity to them that if you want to be a star of this league, you've got to have that kind of passion. Some don't show it on the surface, but Matherin does, so it's easily understood. If he fails in the NBA, it's not going to be because he didn't try. He tries. He really cares. He's also a Canadian, so I'm a fan. I like Matherin. And the Indiana Pacers, with him, are performing better than the Orlando Magic. But I am going to side, if I had to pick, I'm going to side with Ben Caro here, at least for the time being, over Matherin, because of the sheer just volume of his statistical output. He's averaging like over 22, 23 points a game. And Orlando, I know they're not winning games. They're not a good team. And I know that the rookie of the year is often a statistical race. Ben Caro, we haven't seen this kind of statistical output from a rookie in a long, long time. Luca didn't do it, Carl Anthony Towns didn't do it, Embiid did it for like a second, but even still, not at this volume. Bancaro over Matherin for now. But next we're gonna have some fun as we move towards the Defensive Player of the Year in which I'm crowning OG Ananobi, Toronto's own, as the Defensive Player of the Year thus far. I've been screaming for years that OG needs to make an, at least an all-defensive team. Now we're seeing it, especially as we've had this stretch with Pascal Siakam sitting down and OG Ananobi sort of coming front and center in the Raptors rotation and winning games behind his play, both on the offensive and defensive end. But it's important just looking at his defense to understand that he can guard really anyone. In last year's playoffs, I know we lost to the Sixers, but he had real stretches guarding both James Harden, who's one of the craftiest guards there is, and Joel Embiid, who's 7'2", 280, and is one of the biggest, baddest guys in the league. And an Obi, not just because of his versatility and size at 6'7", but also because of his subtle strength. He's like quietly really, really strong. It allows him to guard pretty much every position on the floor in a pinch. And as long as he can stay healthy and finish out a full season, he's a shoe in for an all defensive team and is even threatening to win defensive player of the year. And now going on to six man of the year, where we are going to put Christian Wood in that slot. Christian Wood, it's sort of weird the way he's existing on the Dallas Mavericks because he's pretty much unquestionably their second best player, and yet coach Jason Kidd is still bringing him off the bench. I don't really understand why. Kidd is sort of playing mind games with Wood, trying to motivate him to like rise above the station, become an all-star maybe, or at least a better player, but bringing him off the bench is just like hurting your team. Like he's your second best player, why isn't he starting? All that aside, he's coming off the bench, which means he's eligible for six man of the year, and he's been playing his usual great brand of basketball. He's a, he's a 18 points per game scorer, and he deserves to, be a starter, but he's not, so sixth man of the year. Yay. Now the two closest and most complicated races we have so far, the most improved player and the MVP. We'll start with the MIP, where it's sort of a three-man race right now, starting with sort of the third place guy, which is the Orlando Magic's Bull Bull. Now everyone loves Bull Bull because he's the son of the tallest player in the history of the NBA, Manute Bull. Bull Bull is more skilled than his father, if, even though he's not as tall. He's still really tall, he's seven foot two. And he's been sort of trapped on the Denver Nuggets before this season, and he couldn't really get minutes there, but there were flashes of real ability. He can sort of shoot, and he's got some agility with the ball, and of course he's, he's really long at seven foot two, and he's shown some good passing, and he's finally getting empowerment minutes on the Orlando Magic because they're not very good and they are fine playing younger players anyway. And he's been shining so far. He's having a career best season in every major statistical category. And he sort of leapfrogged the category here from being a sort of fringe player in the NBA, now a starter. He's, a, he's starting games for the Magic and he's been playing great. But here's my one bit of pushback against Bull Bull. Because of his incredible size and his skill at that size, there have been players and fans comparing Bull's abilities to another huge skilled player, Victor Wembanyama, who I've talked about already on this show. Wembanyama, remember, 7-4, killing it in France, gonna be the number one pick in this year's draft. He's averaging 30 points a game. He's incredible. Now, I like Bull Bull. I liked him in the draft. He went second round, I had him ranked in the top 20. I've liked Bull Bull at Oregon, I liked him on the Nuggets, thought he should be getting more minutes, and I liked him so far this season on the Magic. But to compare him to Victor Wembanyama is frankly insulting to, to, to Wemby. Because Bull plays like if Victor Wembanyama was smaller and drunk. No offense. He's a great young talent and he's fun to watch for sure because he's so unique. But, but to compare the two, just because they're tall and can shoot doesn't mean they're the same guy. Listen, Bull Bull, all the best to you. 
but you're not Wimbanyama, sorry. But now moving on to sort of the two who are competing neck and neck right now for the MIP, which is Lowry Markinen of the Utah Jazz and Shea Gilgis Alexander of the Oklahoma City Thunder. This is the example of, in Markinen's case, a role player becoming a star, and in Shea's case, a star becoming a superstar. Shea's averaging over 30 points a game and leading the Oklahoma City Thunder, who we previously thought this season was going to be like a team tanking for Wembanyama sort of near the bottom of the league. Instead, they're like frisky and they're competing for playoff spots and it's in no small part to Shea's incredible scoring output. And also the way he's doing it, Shea scoring as a guard, mostly in the paint and really efficiently. He's so fun to watch. He's like herky-jerky, crafty, and he can shoot the three. It's not like Giannis where he's just like overpowering people in the paint and he can't really shoot from three that much. Shea can shoot threes. He's just choosing to score inside more. Now I'm gonna finish off my wards ballot with the MVP. And it's really been a two-man race thus far between Luka Doncic of the Dallas Mavericks and Jason Tatum of the Boston Celtics. Now this is an example of, in Luka's case, a player putting up incredible numbers and really doing everything for his team. Without Luka, the Mavs would suck, like suck. Luka's averaging over 30 points a game, tons of assists, rebounds, he's doing everything, and his usage rate is higher than anybody's in basketball history as of right now. Luka is doing everything for his team, but the Mavericks still aren't even that good. At the time of this recording, the Mavericks have a losing record, which means you can only imagine what they would be without Luka, but this is why, as of right now, I'm going with Tatum over Luka, because Jason Tatum is similarly important to the Boston Celtics. The team revolves around his scoring. He is the best player on that team. He's also averaging an incredible amount of points, career highs and rebounds, and he's passing the ball better than he ever has before. He fixed all of those problems that knocked him out of the finals last season. He's the best he's ever been, and he's doing it on a team winning an incredible amount of games. And that's the real differentiator here. I know that the Boston Celtics without Tatum would beat the Mavs without Luka. If you subtracted them both, Tatum undoubtedly has the superior supporting cast. And that's part of why he's winning games. But at the end of the day, you gotta reward the winning. It goes back to the idea of what most valuable means. Is it most valuable to the league? Is it most valuable to the team? And the goal of basketball, the goal of any team sport, is to win. If the goal is to put up the most numbers, then the guy who leads the league in scoring will win the MVP every year. But that's not what it's about. It's about winning games. And Tatum is winning the most games and doing so spectacularly. And so for now, Jason Tatum is my pick for the MVP. Now that could change, but as of now, as of the first quarter of the season, done and in the books, Tatum's the guy. This has been the OCAD U Sports Report. I am Avishai Saul, and I will see you all next episode.